Well, we're exploring the second session of four of the Book of Ruth. And as we anticipate, there's typically a week between these sessions, we have a little bit of review. Why this book? And uh, one of the most dramatic books of prophecy in the Bible, strangely enough. The ancient Jewish scriptures often included Ruth with the book of the prophets, interestingly enough. And we regard this book as an essential prerequisite of the study of the book of Revelation. And Ruth, every detail, not only carries the romance along of Boaz and all of that, it also carries along the romance of redemption. It gives us a perspective about God's plan for you and me will be evident here. And that's what we're anxious to understand. What do we mean by the Goel, the kinsman redeemer? And we'll also be, should develop a distinction between Israel and the church. It's amazing how fundamental that is in the Old and New Testament. So we'll move on. And of course, we are interested in the hermeneutics, the theory of interpretation. And we take note of the fact that God says he's spoken by the prophets and multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. There's over 200 different rhetorical devices in the Bible. They're all cataloged for our instruction. And uh, remember, we, you and I tend to fall into what we call the Greek model. We think prophecy is a prediction and its fulfillment. That's our mindset, a prophecy and, and, its, and its prediction and its fulfillment. The Hebrew model is quite different. The Hebrew mind looks for patterns. They see prophecy as a pattern. They see patterns in the nation, which is an indication of the life of the Messiah and vice versa, and other examples. And so, the book of Ruth, it occurs in the days the judges ruled. And it's the ultimate love story at the literary level, and it's so studied in colleges, but also at the prophetic and personal levels. And it's one of the most significant books. Strangely enough, it's an Old Testament book about the church. And one of the strange uh, uh, manifestations of that is that it is always read at the Feast of Shavuot, or what we call the Feast of Pentecost. And its role with Acts chapter 2, the whole thing starts to tie together. Because it profiles the role of the kinsman redeemer. And as I like to emphasize, it's an essential prerequisite to understanding chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. I don't believe you really can grasp that chapter unless you understand the book of Ruth. And so... And by way of review, in the last session, after the husband Elimelech dies and the two sons get married, but they also die, Naomi returns to Bethlehem. And uh, Ruth insists upon staying with Naomi, strangely enough. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people." and thy God, my God. And uh, she was an idol-worshipping Gentile, but she is abandoning everything to embrace this new life. She says to Manomi, Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she says the Lord there, she said, Yehovah, Yehovah the, the, uh, the unpronounceable name of God. Not the Moabite God of Shemosh, but the, the, uh, the God of the Old Testament, yod heh vav <clears throat> A sevenfold decision, whether thou goest, I will go, where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God, my God, where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried, and the Lord do so to me, and more also if aught but death. A sevenfold profile, interestingly enough. And uh, so... So we get to the wrap-up of last time when Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem, the house of bread, interestingly enough, in the beginning of the barley harvest. And it is this book that links Bethlehem to the house of David, strangely enough. And uh, the barley harvest, that's where we cl closed last time. And so that's generally uh, early March, maybe April. Um, as the first hint of, of a, a pickup. We also previewed last time something that you should keep in mind, the agricultural calendar, and uh, the first month being the sun, which is the latter rains, the barley harvest, the flax harvest. The special days in that month is, of course, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, always geared to be on a Sunday. 
those collectively are, called, are alluded to as Passover, using, using that term generically. And uh, then in the second month, we have, uh, ER, we have the uh, dry season begins. And then in the third month, we have Sivan, the early figs ripen, the vine tending. And that's when we have the Feast of Shavuot, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, also called in the Greek the Feast of Pentecost. Prophetically, it speaks of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And that's what's so provocative is that it's at that holiday that the Jews all read the book of Ruth. And there's a spiritual reason for doing that, that they would uh, not likely be sensitive to. And so for what that's worth. And moving on, then we get to the uh, fourth month, Tammuz. That's the wheat harvest and the first ripe grapes show up. And then in, we get to the fifth month, Ab, July or August on our calendar. Uh, that's the grape harvest. And I want you to notice when is the grapes harvest? In the fall. And uh, special days, uh, the ninth of Ab is the day that almost uh, throughout history, the bad things always happen on the ninth of Ab. And, uh, but it's interesting to realize that the only, if grapes are harvested in the fall, there's no way you can get grape juice in the spring. People insist that they use grape juice at communion. That's doesn't, not without refrigeration, by the way. So I'll let you chew on that one. We'll move on. And uh, we have uh, then the sixth month, that's the dates and summer figs and all of that. And the final month is the month of Tishri, which is the beginning of the Genesis calendar, but the seventh month on the Exodus calendar. And uh, that's the early rains. And the special days there are, of course, the fall feasts, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and uh, Feast of Tabernacles, as we call it. So the book of Ruth. Chapter 1 was love's resolve. That was Ruth cleaving to Naomi. This time we're going to take a look at love's response, Ruth gleaning. We'll talk about what all that's about. And then next session will be love's request, and then lo the love's reward as the final redemption. So we're in, going to move into chapter 2. That was all by way of a quick review. Chapter 2, verse 1, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. The word Boaz means in him at strength. And this name is not only important, it's the name given to one of the two pillars of Solomon's temple. And uh, there's a whole study behind that we'll forego for now, but just be sensitive to that, that in him there is strength. And uh, so this is where the plot starts to thicken, because Boaz is a kinsman of Elimelech. And we get the glimmer of a plot coming here. A man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. And uh, it implies a history of valor and strong and strength and so forth. And that's what the word Boaz should come out to you. He's the hero of the peace, obviously. And uh, so... The blood relationship was with Elimelech, not with Naomi, incidentally. It's with the guy. And so we too, just as he was a kins had a kinsman, we also have a, kins a kinsman, one who is made like we are, but sinless, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, according to Hebrews 7. He's the one who is able to save us to the uttermost. So we're going to take, take a special interest in the role and the achievement of Boaz in the plot of this story here. And the name Boaz, of course, means strength, mighty man of wealth and so on. And so, a mighty man of the war and mighty man of the law. And he, so he's the hero of the peace. Okay, verse 2, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now, this gets into a practice that may sound strange to us, what they called gleaning. If you owned land, you could farm it in one pass. What you didn't pick up in one pass was left for the destitute, orphans, widows. That was what they, there were laws on that that reserved that for the disadvantaged. And so whatever was spilled was left for them. And that's what she's going to take. She is the caretaker, so to speak, of Naomi. So she's going to go and glean to provide for the two of them uh, by gleaning. That was the welfare system that they had in those days. The law of gleaning. We find this profiled for you in, in Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 24. 
uh, in 19, when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. Thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. And in, in the Leviticus 23, the, and when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of the harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy, a similar, a similar passage, when thou cuttest down thy harvest in thy field thou, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fathers, for the widow, and the Lord thy God may bless thee in all thy work of thy hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fathers, for the widow. And when thou gatherest grapes of their vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. So this was God's way of providing for the poor. Now, interesting enough, they had to work for it. There were no handouts. They had to go gather it. So there's a, there's a, a, a side, as, a additional aspect to this. So in the third verse in chapter 2, it's speaking of, uh, of uh, Ruth. She came, she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Do you think that she knew that? Do you think she had a, a family tree? No, she happened on that field. Now, that there's an expression among the rabbis that coincidence is not a kosher word. Or the way we often say it, there are no accidents in God's kingdom. So I love the way the Holy Spirit has phrased this here. Her hap was to light on a part of the field. And as some people say, coincidence is when God is working undercover, see? And so, so now we begin to see the plot thicken because she happens on a field that happens to be owned by a very powerful man that is a relative of Elimelech. And uh, the word actually is Magreg, which means unforeseen meeting or event, accident happening, chance, fate. Her hap was to... And a, a happenstance is another way we might express that. And he was a kindred of Elimelech. Now, it's interesting, by the way, something you may not realize. There is a new field of mathematics, relatively new field of mathematics, called chaos theory. There are two concepts that we have in mathematics that we cannot find in the universe. One of those is infinity. We, know, we think we understand it, but we can't find any examples of that. We're not in an infinite uh, the universe is finite, not infinite. But the other concept is randomness. It may surprise you to discover that true randomness is elusive. A proper mathematician will speak of a pseudo-random number, a number that approximates being random. If any procedure to get that number means it's not random. And so it's a very strange thing. And uh, one of the latest studies is this so-called chaos theory, and it's based basically on the elusiveness of randomness, the, our inability to find it. It describes the behavior of certain dynamical systems that are highly sensitive to initial conditions, the butterfly effect and that sort, sort of thing. In the information sciences, it's interesting if you study science, whether it's physics or biology, you name the science, the cutting edge of all our sciences is in a field called information theory. The real issues in biology are now switching theory issues, coding issues, uh, and so the information sciences. And randomness is a very, very elusive. The, the synonym for randomness is entropy. And uh, but that's a term that you might not be comfortable with, but just remember entropy is randomness. And it shocks me to discover there are many of our most conspicuous mathematicians, Stephen Hawking and others, that muck that up. They confuse entropy from information. No, they're opposites. Entropy is the absence of information. Information is some properly called negative entropy. Entropy is randomness. There are two kinds of processes in math. Most of us have been trained in what's called deterministic processes. Two plus two is four, always. Right? You see, it's, it's determined. It's, it's, it's precise. There's another field of 
uh, processes that are called stochastic processes in which there's an element of randomness. How tall is the average person? See, that suddenly starts to beg some other questions. And the study of stochastic processes is a study of advanced statistics, not just descriptive statistics, but advanced statistics. And it's one of the most sophisticated fields that you can get into, strangely enough. And so, but that also is a pursuit of pseudo-random numbers. One of the things that you discover is very hard to get your hands on is a, a, a back, I was in the Rand Corporation in 1955, the Rand Corporation published a book called One Million Randed Digits with 100,000 Normal Deviates. And when you picked up that book, I have one in my office, pick up that book and open it, you think it's a joke. It's groups of five, in groups of five numbers that are random. Here's a book of random, it, it, the layman picks it up and thinks this is a put on, a joke. A book of random numbers, that's meaningless. We hope so. See the problem, what made it a milestone at the time is the Rand Corporation had access to the supercomputers of the Department of Defense and they studied those numbers to make sure there was no symmetry, no patterning, no predictability. They used advanced computer techniques to make sure there was no predictability. It was absolutely, they used computers to make sure there was no design. It was truly, ra randomness is the opposite of design. You follow me? Okay. And if you saw this book, rather than carry it around, I just put it in the PowerPoint, simpler. That's what it looks like. It's just groups of numbers. And the layman looks at that and laughs and says, that must be a joke. No, it's not. It's, it was an achievement at the time. It's not as trivial as it sounds. Its defining characteristic is the total absence of design. I mention that because in today's world, there's the most bizarre inversion of truth. We, we teach our kids that when we encounter design, in fact, the most elegant designs we encounter, be it a leaf on a tree or a, a bird's feather, it evidences design that is fantastic. And we attribute that to randomness. That is, math, that is definitively mathematically absurd. The more elegant the design, the more it is on the opposite end of the, the scale. And so, for what it's worth. So randomness, or true randomness or entropy, is defined as the absence of design. And yet we teach our kids that they're the results of a random accident, a cosmic accident. And that, what that does, that demonstrates a complete void of understanding of what the very terms mean. When somebody argues about entropy and design, they demonstrate they have no grasp of what either word means, what entropy means or what design means. And so, the, fortunately, the, the most advanced sciences we have, the information sciences, have obliterated the very foundations of evolutionary thought. It still remains as the politically correct perspective, and that's why we have science and technology. How are they different? Technology produces products, so it's self-validating. Science is a priesthood with a creed that if you deviate from, you jeopardize your career. Which came first, the DNA or the proteins? They had to be designed together. They had to be designed together. Anyway, and if you go down this path, you want to be aware of a book called The Privileged Planet. Most of, us, you, most of you who have studied this are familiar with the anthropic principle. It's as if the entire universe was designed for man. And that's an interesting study in its own right. But uh, it's a book has come out called The Privileged Planet in which the, the universe turns out to be uniquely positioned, not just for life, but for being discovered. It's amazing as we discover more about the universe, it's not only designed for man to live, it's designed for man to discover his surroundings. And that discovery is really our position in the galaxy, our position to, because we can get total eclipses, it introduces us to spectroscopy, and uh, the visible spectrum and so forth. So that implies teleology, not only design, but design with a purpose. And that's staggering. And uh, Gilio Gonzalez and Jay Richards came out with a book called The Privileged Planet, and there's a DVD on that also, that not only are we designed, it, it was a purposeful design. And that goes the next step. It's really quite breathtaking to get into that. I'll leave that with you. But in Proverbs 16.33, the last verse of Proverbs 16, 
It says the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is the Lord. Okay, and so as Einstein pointed out, God does not play dice. Do you know why? If he did, he'd win. <laughs> okay, anyway, moving on. So there's two imputed concepts that are elusive in the physical world, randomness and infinity. And uh, so in our macrocosm, we know that we're in a finite universe. In the microcosm, we discover, in other words, in terms of largeness, we know the universe may be expanding, but it's finite, not infinite. That's the great discovery of 20th century science. At the other end, in terms of the microcosm, things smaller than we are, we discover that in smallness, there's a limit to smallness. That whether you're talking about length, mass, energy, or time, it's made up of indivisible units, and that's, that uh, discovery is staggering in its implications. And so um, I'm delighted with Scientific American. In June of 2005, they had an article on this, and they pointed out that if our universe constants are changing, it means that our reality is but a shadow of a larger reality. And when I saw that, I just, it blew me away because that's exactly what the Bible has been saying from the beginning. But uh, let's get back to Ruth here. So she happens, by the design of God, to stumble on the field of Boaz. So, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto his reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. So the name Boaz, the Lord of the harvest, if you will. Then said Boaz to his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? Now here's where I stumble over an observation I think is fascinating. Every place in the Bible where the Holy Spirit is typified by a person, it's always an unnamed servant. Who introduces Ruth to Boaz? An unnamed servant. We don't know his name. There are other places, like in the Akedah, in Genesis 22 and 24, where Abram is the model of the father, and uh, 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 Isaac, his son, and uh, the eldest servant is his eldest servant. But there you can find out his name by going back to Genesis 15. We know his, the name of Abram's eldest servant was Eliezer, which means comforter. So it's fascinating to me that even here in this little model, Boaz introduced to the ramsel by an unnamed servant. And you may think I'm making something out of nothing, but withhold your judgment until you have the whole story coming out here. Anyway, boy, said, whose damsel is this? Uh, and uh, so she's introduced by an unnamed servant. And uh, we know that in Genesis 24, it was Eliezer, Abraham's servant. And why is the Holy Spirit always modeled or typified, if you will, by an unnamed servant? And Jesus explains that to us in John 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. And it fascinates me to see how literally that's applied, that the Holy Spirit always portrays himself as an unnamed servant. Even when he has a name, it's absent from that particular part of the record. I think that's fascinating. I think that's fascinating. Now, by the way, this servant is responsible to supervise the workers, supply provisions for the reapers, and pay them at the end of the day. And that's, that's the procedure here. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. So she obviously has developed a reputation for herself already. So the servant is the Nar, he was the foreman, obviously, and he's responsible for the supervision and all that. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued, even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. This is what we would say the fix is in. He obviously... Boaz, you know, likes what he sees. He says, go not to glean in another field. So in other words, the invitation was extended to continue gleaning in his fields permanently. That's what he's arguing for. She's free to continue throughout the barley harvest, which included March and April. 
She's also free to continue through the wheat harvest, which is forthcoming, which includes May and June. You with me so far? Okay. Boaz continues, Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. In other words, she's supposed to stay in his field. She is free to follow immediately after the servant girls, where it be the most numerous and so forth. And his intervention and provision on her path is no... So you're beginning to get the picture here. She's not only favored here, she's caught the eye of this guy. Okay? All right. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And uh, it's sort of, there's a Hebrew play on words, that you have noticed the unnoticed is sort of a flavor of what it's saying there. Grace, of course, is the basis. That's going to be very important as we go here. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come into a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Isn't that eloquent? That's just great. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And uh, now the Hebrew word for reached here is tzabat, which means to seize with the hand. The word is only used here and nowhere else in the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew it's singular, which means that Boaz personally served here with his hands, is what's implied in the grammar, for what it's worth. Just an insight here. And, of course, the vinegar thing is really a drink made from sour grapes that they're talking about there. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young man, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. (laughs) In other words, the Hebrew says, even between the sheaves she may glean. So the fix is in, is what we're seeing here. Okay. And it's unusual for a gleaner to be allowed to pick up grain this close to the harvesters. They're normally permitted to glean only after the harvesters had completed all their work. And and notice this, I love this, verse 60, says, and let fall also some of the handfuls on purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. And it was some years ago in my ministry, I remember getting a, le- a letter of encouragement from one of our subscribers. It says, Chuck, what we like about you is that you leave handfuls on purpose. <laughs> and she, they used that phrase, obviously, from this study. But I thought that was that was charming. Handfuls on purpose. Handfuls of ears. And it's used only here in the Hebrew Bible, by the way. And uh, see, if they were to pull out a handful of stalks, this is the amount of grain that would be grasped with the left hand as the sickler cuts with his right. So the fix is in, basically. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was an ephah of barley. Now, ten, apparently 10 ephah is about 90 gallons, if you get a feeling for this, or putting it another way, it's about 9 gallon consumption. And if Ju, uh, Josephus' computation of a bath or ephah is right, 9 gallons is about right for this. And that's, that's we draw on Josephus for that perspective, it seems about right here. A dry measure of one bushel capacity, it corresponds to the bath in liquid measure and was the standard for measuring grain and similar articles, if you will. And she took it up and went into the city, And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she uh, was sufficed. And so it's interesting, it's about 30 pounds of barley. That's enough for five days for the both of them. So she came home pretty well uh, taken, and and plus her own leftover provisions. And her mother-in-law, Naomi, said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? She smells a fix here, doesn't she? The mother, see, Ruth might be oblivious to the 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 the, uh, 
the organization of the community. But uh, Naomi is a good Jewish mother. Okay. <laughs> where hast thou gleaned that? Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she was wrought and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. So this turns the light on. Naomi immediately realizes the implications of what's going on here. Okay. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living or to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. So this is where the pulse quickens. This is where you realize the plot's unfolding. This is a, a ray of sunshine in a very, very dark period in their lives. One of our next kinsmen. Now the Goel is, is Boaz, connected with the concept of the kinsman redeemer. So that concept here is going to be uh, typified for us. So we'll under, get a grasp of what a Goel is all about. And the reason we're interested in that is because we have a Goel, none other than the Lord Jesus. And we'll understand his role by understanding what's really going on here, which is why this is so rich. And, and Ruth the Moabite has said, he said unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. So Naomi now realizes the fix is in, says she's caught his eye here somehow. Okay. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens and that they meet thee not in any other field. So see, Naomi is starting to coach her and she's going to coach her for the scene that's going to come up in the next session, a scene which nine out of ten people misunderstand because they don't have the background. Okay, and so make sure they, they, that they meet thee not in another field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So it came in two stages. First, the barley harvest, which began with the Feast of First Fruits around the end of March or the beginning of April, and ended with the Feast of Weeks. And the second, the wheat harvest, which began in the Feast of Weeks around the end of May or the beginning of June, continued to the end of June, the first part of July. Get the picture so far? Okay. And uh, so, to the end of the uh, uh, barley harvest and of the wheat harvest. So we're talking several months here, obviously. Okay. The wheat harvest is about 50 days after the barley harvest, and it's, it's about time of Shavuot, uh, the, what we call the Feast of Pentecost, because of the 50 days, see? Now, the Jewish liturgy requires the reading of the book of Ruth at Shavuot, which is hard to explain from a Jewish perspective. It's very conspicuously obvious from a New Testament perspective, because Shavuot is where Acts 2 happens. It's really the birth of the church. And that's why it's the use of, of uh, leavened bread in Shavuot is so peculiar. Okay. So to summarize chapter 2, Ruth happens on the field of Boaz, and she's introduced to him by the unnamed servant. These are the highlights here. She finds favor in his field. Boaz is a kinsman of Elimelech. Okay. Therefore, he's potentially eligible to serve as a kinsman redeemer. Okay. Now, we're going to discover in chapter 3 that there is one kinsman still closer than he is. So we're going to look at the law of redemption in preparation for chapter 3 and the law of what's called the Leverite marriage. Now, the law of redemption has to do with the land. And you need to, you'll understand that if I just point out that the land was not sold in uh, what we call fee simple in, our, in the Western culture. You didn't get title to the land. You got its use. And so you could sell its use for a number of years, but uh, it was redeemable if there were years left and a relative could step in to, to redeem it and so forth. That's what we're going to talk about. So let's just take a look at this. Israel, you see, belongs to God. Not They can't take title there. When Joshua entered the land, it was granted to the 12 tribes. The land was to stay in that tribe is the concept. You could sell the land, which was really more of what we'd consider a lease. You sold the rights to use the land for a while. Okay. In the year of Jubilee, that's 49 Sabbath years plus one, uh, the land would return to its original owners. And that's a strange time. 
when you sold your land, the title deed would also include rules for title uh, redemption. The law required a procedure so that if your next of kin would show up, there was some procedure where he could purchase back the unused years, and that was called redeeming the land. Okay. Now, it's interesting, when you study Jeremiah 25, a very strange event occurs in the history of Jeremiah that most people are puzzled by. Jeremiah was instructed to buy land right before he, they knew the 70-year captivity was going to start. But God tells him to go buy some property, which is weird because he won't survive the return after the captivity. Why would he buy property? Because God told him to. So he, when he, after, that, after that captivity, Jeremiah's descendants will come back and claim the land by redeeming it. That's what it sets up. That part isn't explained. You have to infer that. But it, it, that's why it's there, to teach us about title deeds. Why does it want to teach us about title deeds? Because that's what's going on in Revelation chapter 5. Without that background, with the role that's written within and on the backside, that's a title deed and a seal with seven seals. And those seals have to be broken to redeem the land. It had to be a kinsman. That All that, well, all that comes to play in Revelation chapter 5, if you have the background here. Okay, the title would be a scroll on the back of which would detail the procedure for the redemption. Okay. Now there's another law that's pretty little, pretty strange, and that's the law of Leverite marriage. The word levir is Latin for a husband's brother. And uh, it dealt with a situation where a widow had no issue. Her husband passed away with no children. She could go to the next of kin and put a claim on him to take her to wife to raise up children for the family. That was called a Leverite marriage. Now, he had to meet three conditions to make this work. If he goes, she goes to the next of kin, first he had to be a near kinsman, obviously. Secondly, he had to be able to perform. And thirdly, he had to be willing. In other words, it was voluntary. He didn't have to do it. He had a choice. Those are the, th the, the three conditions. Had to be a kinsman, had to be able to perform, had to be willing to perform. That's going to come up in... In, uh, but when you get to chapter 4. If he chose not to, he had to give her his shoe, which was in that situation a symbol of shame. If she put the bite on him to do the to kinsman's part and he refused, he took off his shoe and gave the shoe to her as an evidence of shame. He, he's admitting that he's shamed by not stepping up to that. So it was a symbol of shame, okay? Because he had failed to do the kinsman part. And that's going to come up in chapter 4. Okay. So the laws of ancient Israel. The law of gleaning we experience in chapter 2. We've just been through that one. But the law of Leverite marriage will come up in chapter 3. And the law of redemption will occur in chapter 4. One reason most people don't really understand the book of Ruth is they don't have the benefit of understanding those three ancient laws of ancient, the laws of ancient Israel. But they're all there for you, and as part of your background, you can double back on that and get a feeling for what those things really uh, talk about. So in our next session, I'd like you to review the law of redemption in Leviticus 25, the law of Leverite marriage in Deuteronomy 25, and, and then study Ruth chapter 3, and, uh, which is widely misunderstood by the uninformed. So as you read ahead in chapter 3, you need to understand that when she approaches Boaz at night, she is not soliciting like a prostitute. It's worse than that. She's asking her, she's asking him to be the, to, to marry her, to put his authority over her, to put his skirt over her. And so, uh, I'm just letting you know in advance, as you read chapter three, don't fall in the trap of misunderstanding that, as most people would without the background. What she's actually asking for is more profound than uh, most people realize. It gets even more complicated than that because she has two choices. She could be married to him to her benefit rather than Naomi's. But she does it in such a way that it's to Naomi's benefit. And so there's subtleties to, to the plot here that most people wouldn't unravel and we'll be dealing with that as we go forward in the third session in chapter 3. And so uh, uh, I encourage you to do a little homework 
and realize that in chapter 3 comes the big event, what's known as the thrashing floor scene. And uh, you want to really understand what's going on there by the subtleties involved. And that sets the stage for the big climax in chapter 4. And I'll just warn you in advance that chapter 4 will have some very unusual surprises hidden away inside it.